Hi listeners, Jason here. Joelle, Peter, Haley, and I are taking a five-week podcasting break over the Christmas period to fill our buckets in preparation for what is going to be a huge 2024. For those that hate to go a week, however, without a Psych Health and Safety podcast, we've got you covered with five of our very favorite episodes from 2023. Definitely take a listen if you missed any of these episodes during the year. On behalf of the team, we wish you a happy and safe holiday period and look forward to bringing you more of the very best in Psych Health and Safety when we return on 16 January. Now, on to this episode. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a safety prerogative, this is the source of information on psychological injury prevention and health promotion. Hello, welcome to the UK Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Peter Kelly. I am Head of Psychological Health and Safety for Flourish DX in the UK, and my co-host is Hayley. How are you, Hayley? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. I forgot what day of the week it was. feels like it's been such a long week already, but I'm all good. How are you? I'm good. I've, I've, I've been living my health and well-being dream. I've been running on the weekend and pulled a, pulled a hamstring. Um, and then this morning I've gone to the gym and my personal trainer, because I go to this, I'm over 50s now, I'm on this 50s um, thing for men. Um, and uh, uh, he made me plank for 70 seconds. Now, I don't know if any of you have planked before, but it's that's some serious like length of time when you're 50 to sort of like plank and do, and do all sorts of other stuff. But I'm told it will make me feel better. I'm not convinced because the pain is the pain is very very real as uh, as I sit here having just uh, put on loads of ibuprofen. Do you do, do you do much exercise, Haley? I do, and I, our guest speaker today also does a lot of exercise. So yeah, I think we could probably both say we we can plank and we have planked. Um, in my um, other life, I suppose, I'm a personal trainer. So, yeah, I, I do advocate for, for physical movement of any any kind, really. But I'm sorry to hear that you're, you're struggling, Pete. Not ideal. Uh, no, I, I, the problem was I, I, I was I woke up late for park run. And so instead of warming <laughs> up, I just bolted down to the park, which is not very far for me. And in the process, I didn't warm up. So it's entirely down to my fault. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll learn from it. But given that you've just given us, a, given us a little bit of insight of what our, our next guest is going to does in his, in his spare time, let me pass you over to them and let them introduce themselves. Over to you. How are we doing both? Great to uh, great hit to be here. Great to see you both. So yeah, I'm Jamie Broadley. I'm the group head of health and wellbeing at, at Circo. Uh, and as Haley can start there as well, also have uh, some sporting interests in the in the background too. So you've got two personal trainers on the call today, Peter. So you could uh, we could save you some money. We could uh, we could do some plans for you. I I I just wish I'd never brought this conversation up now. Okay. <laughs> Watch the chances so of personal notes. trainers. <laughs> Yes. How about we just we just scrap the the intended conversation and we'll just talk all about movements and personal training. <laughs> Sound like a good idea? Jamie and I can talk for hours. <laughs> oh, I'm oh, sure we can. Yeah, but welcome, Jamie. It's it's really awesome to have you here um, as a fellow uh, colleague, I suppose, in the space who's also implemented ISO forty five thousand and three and been certified. So really excited to explore your background, um, and an overview of your experience. So thanks for joining us. Oh, pleasure is all mine. I've uh, learned the very little that I know in this space, mainly from both of you. So uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a, a privilege to get to have this conversation. I was just about to say I'm in the room of legends. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so without further ado, let's jump in. Um, Jamie, I'd love to hear your views of psych health and safety as a concept and the role it plays in well-being. Yeah, so I think this is a, I mean, to, to kick off with, I think I've heard 
both of you articulate the kind of definitions behind psych health and safety and the, the, the broader implications of the concept far better than I ever could. So I'll, I'll defer to both of you on that one. I just copy and paste whatever you, uh, you say. But I think um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for the, the wellbeing space to embrace this. Um, as I've heard you said before, this isn't a new thing. It's just we're, we're bringing this back to the surface and putting it front of mind for us all. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to actually kind of be preventative, which is something that I think a load of us in the in wellbeing roles in the wellbeing space have kind of made aims towards in um, recent years. But I'm not sure how much progress we've actually actually made. So this is, I think, a, a great opportunity to work more closely with colleagues from health and safety teams to pull in HR, all the other disciplines that are involved, and actually get behind being properly preventative and properly managing um, well-being risks in a in a much more structured way than than we have done before. And I think that kind of baking good well-being practice into the into the recipe from an organisational point of view is is hugely important. I talk about kind of well-being by stealth. So where can we have positive practice without having to call it well-being? I think is a is a really important. Um, concept and underneath all of this one of the reasons that i got into this space is that i've got a core belief that work should be good for us um and i think we've got quite far away from that in recent times with obvious reasons given the context that we've all navigated so i think it's an opportunity to get back a little bit closer towards that uh, that aim as well fantastic I, I love your call out on well-being by stealth and and moving away from just using the word well-being to be able to do good and make sure our people are healthy. So really interesting approach and, and can strongly agree with that approach, you know, rather than just discussing well-being, linking it to a number of other activities that are happening in the business and the impact that it will have on people. And stealth, well-being by stealth, that's a brilliant thing. I'm going to have to use that is actually what, what we're trying to do. I mean, um, the whole well-being debate is such a crazy subject at the moment with so many different variations and things that are going well but i like that so i'm so if you do hear it at any future conferences it's wholly down to jamie but i'm going to use it so there you go i've stolen from still, both of you enough, so it's about time you still back yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. okay so jamie let me ask you then if it's well-being by by stealth what do you currently see as the status of psych health and safety in the UK at present. We'll all yeah, have opinions on this. <laughs> it's it's an interesting one. I heard your conversation with Jonathan from from the other week and I thought his perspective was was really interesting of kind of we all operate in a, a space where we're having a lot more conversations about this now. Yet that might not be reflective of the the kind of the wider culture as a whole. Um what I have seen, and I know Haley, we've talked about this previously as well, that since getting that certification of, of 45,003, the amount of people reaching out, wanting to learn more, wanting to find out how we how we did it, um, that's been really promising and that uh, suggests that there is that appetite there to, to do more around this. Um, I think what I see is the, and what I've learned from those conversations is that people have got a real challenge around, okay, well, we... We agree with this approach and we want to set off down this road, but there's some significant challenges in operationalizing it where perhaps organizations don't have some of those um, systems in, in the background. So perhaps where they haven't got strong safety cultures because of the industry they're in or, or other challenges like that. Um, certainly kind of tech startups and, and those spaces as well, again, not got necessarily the infrastructure behind it, um, which mm. I've been able to lean on here at, uh, here at Serco. Um, I think also seen the kind of the competing priorities. So pretty much all of us in this uh, kind of wellbeing space in these kind of roles have been doing a lot of firefighting over recent years. So whether it be the pandemic, whether it be cost of living, everything that um, both of those have thrown up, the opportunity to take that step back, try and be strategic, try and create some headspace and, and think forward and what are the kind of things that we need to be in now to get to where we want to go in three to five years. That's been a bit of a luxury that I don't think many people have, have necessarily had. Um, so I think that's been a challenge as well. Um, and then the other place that I've seen this get sticky for people is just who owns it. So um, it kind of falls between health and safety teams, HR teams, operational teams, who's going to pick the, the ball up and really drive it forward here. Um, and again, that's one of the things that um, I've been lucky with at Circa and that we already had um, a setup which 
all of their teams were working closely together, so it made it a lot easier for us. But speaking with others, that's not necessarily the, the case elsewhere. So as a whole, um, in, in summary, I think there is that appetite there and we're certainly looking at so what kind of colleagues in Australia are looking at the minute with the, the legislation coming there. And I know that there's similar things that um, are likely to happen in, in the EU and, and elsewhere. We need to be doing this and there is that appetite and that desire to be uh, to be moving this forward. But actually making those those steps is the um, is challenging for people. Yeah. And I guess also because um, you started your journey, didn't you, um, in this area before the pandemic? So which is um, um, one thing that's fascinating for me to yeah. have been involved, obviously, when I was at HSC. Is pre-pandemic we were seeing seven, you know, seventeen point nine million days lost to work road stress, and uh, eight hundred thousand days of uh, people off. So, and then in the pandemic we've you know we're still at seventeen million. Um, so, would you agree really that there was um there's been a psych and health, psych health and safety need in the UK for many many oh. years? Um, and to Definitely. to what extent do you think? 45,003 maybe it came at the right time middle of a pandemic but you know its development predates the pandemic yeah completely and um i think i'm i have a slightly kind of biased view because all of the the well-being roles that i've been in have been in uh kind of frontline service um, style organizations so previously in the nhs now in circo where we, we're delivering government services and that's kind of right at the sharp end of, of a lot of the, the challenges that have come to bear, not just as a result of the pandemic and, and current cost of living challenges, but plenty of the, the kind of the warning signs or um, the precursors to some of these challenges were, were in place beforehand. So, yeah, I, I think we've just seen an acceleration um, as a result of these challenges that we've, we've been through rather than creating completely new things. So, yeah, completely agree with you, but the, the, the timing was was good because we had the we had the ear of decision makers um, and we've been able to use that to to make more progress in this space than we perhaps otherwise would have done at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think just to build build on what Jamie's saying, um, just reflecting. I guess the the nice thing about this is when you speak to so many people, you come away and then you reflect on some of that conversation, and sometimes your thought process evolves in the space. But I think. The thing we're struggling and from people reaching out asking questions is how to quantify the impact of psychological health and safety and how to use it as one of the, and I say one of, the measurements to drive data-driven decisions within organizations. And I think that if we think about status, where we are, where where this sits, there's, there's some space some room for improvement in, in using the data holistically, you know, leading and lagging indicators, um, but helping us use the data for leaders to understand. And I think that will help us improve the uptake um, and, and mm. really understand the urgent need for, in our opinion, as three, three of us on this call, for psych health and safety risk management in an organization. To achieve sustainability in terms of of your workforce yeah completely and I've, I've not come across anyone that's got that uh absolutely nailed down yet i think the kind of the best that any of us are doing are pulling together elements of of data from lots of disparate sources so whether it be from kind of uh, risk assessments annual employee surveys kind of hr people data and bringing all of those together and trying to use that in a holistic way to to make decisions that's a, about as good as I've seen any any doing, and I know that um, the likes of Flourish are, are trying to change that and, um, and make some positive strides in this space, which is great. We, we're crying out for, um, for for good practice around that. I'd suggest. Mm. I think Jamie, you alluded to you know that there being so many business critical priorities. So, given your experience, how do you oper operationalize psych health and safety amongst? these other business priorities? Yeah, and that, that's simply been the big question that anyone that I've spoken to who, who's reached out off the back of the, the 45,003 certification, that, that's the question that they've been wanting to, to ask. And I, I think from my point of view, I came into to Circo 
with no real background in um, kind of working through these kind of, of processes. So it's something I, I had to learn. So the, the message I give everyone is if I can do it, then they definitely can. Um, and I think it, it started from an asset based approach. So looking at what's already what's already working, what's already strong, what's already kind of understood and is embedded culturally. And um, the place that I started with that is looking at the, the kind of the governance routes. So where are we having these conversations in formal committees and how is that kind of flowing through the organization up to, to board level and trying to stitch those together to make sure that there's a, a really clear route that the board understand up here right through to kind of the cliched NHS term is board to ward. And so something happens on the front line. How do we make sure that that learning is transmitted right the way through the organization? And a really helpful exercise is just kind of on a big piece of paper, mapping out all of those different uh, committees, where are those conversations happening? Um, and perhaps there's then a few changes that need to be made in, uh, in terms of reporting lines. But I think getting that set early is really, really important. So there's that oversight over everything that we're, we're then doing in this space. And then in terms of the uh, kind of the actual making an impact to colleagues with this, it's well mapping out again, what are all those employee touch points? So it could be from kind of day one in an organization of what's the first conversation that you have with your manager to kind of team meetings, town halls, one-to-ones, working through all of those day one of absence and making sure that there are these principles embedded at those those points so that we're factoring in this psychological health and safety approach within all of those. Um, and we're, uh, we're, we're wrapping around and making this holistic. Because I think what a lot of what mm. we see is there's, there's good practice, but it's not joined up and it's not consistent through um, through all of those um, kind of colleague journey touch points. Um, and then the final bit, which I suppose is a, a broader lesson for wellbeing as a whole, rather than just um, just this topic is, that consistency of just keeping showing up, keeping like I've had to stand in plenty of empty rooms over uh, over my career. But the more that you keep doing that, the more people will eventually come into that room and realise that. I think we've we've seen in the wellbeing space there's been a lot of kind of flash in the pan style activities where we're going to go down this route road. This is going to be the approach, and we're all bought in. That lasts mm. two months, and then we're on to the next shiny thing. Whereas actually mm -hmm. to our earlier points about kind of baking this in and, and making it part of the, the approach to the whole, we need to be consistent. We need to keep showing up. We need to keep having these conversations, sending these, these messages out and using some of the, um, the kind of plain English language around it. Um, and I think that that's certainly some of the feedback that we've had as well of putting this into really simple terms um, has, has been useful and has helped because as ever with, um, with health and safety language, some of it can um can be a bit complicated for some people out in the, the front line absolutely i think you've hit the nail on the head with the systems approach that you've just explained so in practice it is it's about the system and it's about the embedding is what you've you shared which and that I, I must point out though the way you said the safety language is quite difficult and for some people it just doesn't engage them mm. right I mean, I know yeah. if I talk psychosocial hazard, it's like eyes fall out the head. You know, it's about that engagement piece as well at all levels, you know. Yeah, 100%. I think the mm -hmm. kind of looking at the, the business and um, that I'm in, like the average reading age in the UK is what, 10, 11, something like that. Uh, if we look at the, the people that are working in our frontline services, like we have a large number of people who English as a second language, uh, kind of different cultural backgrounds, really diverse mix of people. So we need to make sure all of that's factored in as well. And I think a criticism of, of well-being in, in the past is that a lot of it's been quite kind of white middle class in its pitch because it's written by people like people like us. So we need to make sure that that is being translated out into, to say, that plain English approach that's going to make sense to someone in their, their day, day job on the front line. Hi, listeners. Jason here. We hope you're enjoying this latest podcast episode. Now, if you're like Joelle, Alicia and myself and enjoy learning from the best, then the Flourish DX Academy is for you. The Academy includes free e-learning courses on the ISO 45003 standard for psychological health and safety at work and associated topics such as how to conduct a psychosocial risk assessment and how to create the business case for psych health and safety. All courses feature high quality videos, downloadable resources, multi-choice questions and a downloadable training certificate on completion. 
take your learning to the next level with all Flourish DX Academy courses included within the Flourish DX mobile app. Select podcast episodes from the Psych Health and Safety Podcast and sister podcasts from Canada and the USA are also included. Get started with Flourish DX for free at www.flourishdx.com forward slash get hyphen started. That's www.flourishdx.com forward slash get hyphen started. Now back to this episode. Absolutely. And it's interesting, you know, simplifying the language on the front line. Um, I'd like to ask you this question about also how you, um, what are some of the challenges of adopting psych health and safety management approach from the C-suite? And is Mm. language one of them? Definitely. I think so, yeah. Um, And and we found, I think, kind of the the term that's used in in this context is psychosocial risk, isn't it? And in Australia, there was a really good understanding of that. That was, that's been part of the, the kind of the cultural lexicon for, for a while in the UK, less so. So that was uh, a bit of translation that we, we needed to do there. Um, I think from a, a C-suite perspective, they've probably been bombarded with, um, very well-meaning well-being kind of requests over the, the past few years of we need X amount of cash for this next new shiny thing, which they never really see a really clear ROI around. Um, and before long, we're, we're back knocking on the door again. So I think kind of making them see that this is different and that we're talking about something which is, to your point, Haley, much more kind of uh, a systems approach. Um, so the, the way that, um, that we did it, um, Circa, was to link it to our current risk management approaches. So anyone that's sitting in that boardroom is going to be really well-versed and really expert in um, their uh, approach to risk management. So I think embedding it within that, and we we merged our well-being and health and safety risks together to make sure that we were um, keeping the language consistent, and that we then had all of those kind of governance processes, which I mentioned earlier, uh, cascading out of that. And the the, the conversations that um, that people in that um, those boardrooms will be having, the amount of people challenges and people risks that they'll have seen over the, the past few years are, are huge. So really pitching this as a way of getting upstream of some of those and trying to be truly preventative rather than just fighting those those challenges that they're, they're, that they're seeing. Um, and I think the other bit that when I've spoken with others in, in this space, we often think that we need to do something at a kind of organizational level or not at all. Whereas actually the the opportunities to to pilot, to do case studies, to try things out, I think we, we should be open to that. And if we can bring some live examples into those conversations, then that helps really reinforce that this isn't just a, a theoretical exercise. This is something that can work and is working with our people. Um, and I've always found that to be a lot more, a lot more of a kind of powerful persuader than just bringing something which is straight out of a, a shiny brochure. Um, are any of those challenges insurmountable? Because one of the common things I used to hear as an inspector is, oh, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. And, but they do, they just, um, they put the, the psychosocial risk into the too hard category. So yeah. do you, did you find that, you know, or have you just worked your way around? I mean, both you and Haley will have a position on how you work your way around the C-suite on this area. Yeah, and I think, I, I don't know whether my experience is, is absolutely reflected, but I've been really lucky in that I've been knocking on open doors. Um, and actually, like, as I said, the, the kind of the people in those rooms are, are experts around risk management. That's why they're, they're there. So just making sure there's the understanding around kind of what this is um, and translating some of the, the language across. As soon as they, they, they got it, then they were bigger champions of it than, than I could ever be. And, and that makes life an awful lot easier from there. So, um, yeah, I think uh, definitely not insurmountable and, and would really encourage uh, anyone that's considering this to just go and have those conversations and go and get started with, with this dialogue mm-hmm. because, um, yeah, you'll, you'll probably find that it's a lot easier a conversation than you might have been anticipating. Yeah, and to build on that is allyship. And I know we speak about that in the space of ed and I, but allyship mm-hmm. and well-being and those people who who are already flying a flag and how can we we work with them, like Jamie said, to pilot or to to just broaden what they're already doing into um, a risk-based approach or help them understand the links between the different elements of work that have an impact on well-being. You know, it's not just mental health, but it's change management, it's working relationships, it's flexibility within your work, 
all the factors, you know, the three categories that we spoke about with Kate last week, um, <clears throat> how do all of those impact work and, and well-being? And I think that is a way around it because as you build allyship, you get case studies. And I think the other thing is in amongst the business critical, um, it's often is put in the too hard category because they're dealing with reaction. So you're reacting to a lot of the stuff. So a lot of time in my HR, when I was in, in HR specifically, a lot of my time was spent doing industrial relations or employee relations and fighting fires when that person is unwell or when that person is mm. returning or we are managing performance. So it's about helping them to, to say, let's go upstream. And we talk about it really easily, but how do we, how do we make it tangible for them to understand that we have the conversations earlier on, we identify the hazards earlier on in terms of impacts to the team, it's going to save you time later um, because time is finite and we know middle management are so squeezed is yeah. the conversation that we hear often, um, regardless of what organization you're working for, but they're the ones who are facing the employees, but also get it cascaded down from the top. So how do we help them to, to use their time to prevent, I think is is something that we can focus on as well. Um, right. I think one of my favorite questions are probably because <laughs> I know that we, we speak about some of this, you know, in our wider groups, in our wider well-being leadership teams around some of the frustrations around the current landscape of well-being in the UK. So I'd love to hear from you, Jamie. I'll come over to you next, Pete. <laughs> Yeah, I think we could all come off a, a fairly long run up on this one. Uh, it, it might be a, a separate podcast uh, episode in and of itself. Um, yeah, I think that everyone that I speak to, that we've all got uh, slight frustrations in, in this space at the minute. And uh, I think one of the, the big ones for me is that we've kind of ended up, as much of the, the rest of the world, in quite a kind of influencer culture in it, where often there's only kind of one or two people within an organisation that are, uh, are tasked with with well-being and the the draws for them to do things externally and the rewards that they might get from that are um, uh, are quite potent. So there's a, a real danger of this kind of disconnect between what we all talk about in this very little rarefied well-being space on LinkedIn or uh, events and conferences, and then what's the actual reality in an organisation. And as I say, I've always worked in organisations which are very kind of frontline focused and if i listen to some of the conversations that happen as saying those those kind of well-being forums and then take those to the front line there's an absolute disconnect there between between them the the two realities and i think the the kind of the core piece that i keep in in mind for myself is that our aim in this well-being space should be to make ourselves redundant if we're good at our jobs and we get things properly set up then we don't need a well-being person within an organization is, is my belief because the system takes care of itself and we've got all of the other uh, elements already already there and just functioning properly. Um, yeah, I think what we've seen in, in the well-being space as it's matured is the there are kind of rewards there for people to be the the kind of the keynote speakers that um, uh, can do very well out of, um, of pushing messages which aren't necessarily connected to, to what's going to make a difference on the the front line and ultimately good practice in any space definitely well-being tends to be pretty boring it's not particularly sexy it's not the kind of stuff that sells conference tickets um but it it works um so i think we need to to move from this kind of shiny let's plug in some tech solution and um, let's get a new product in let's do some uh, some some guest speaking into something which is much more uh, much more dull, but much more uh, effective as a uh, as a result. I think um, I will get off my old man soapbox now, but would love to hear both of your thoughts on this one as well. Well, Jamie, you're not entitled uh, to be on the uh, the old man um, <laughs> soapbox, but um, no, I mean I think we've we've got some very clear things that are happening in the well-being movement. Um, I, you talk about maturity, I talk about growth spurts, and mm. I think the, uh, 
that the wellbeing movement has had significant growth spurts, and I'm not sure it is at the moment. Um, it, it, it's certainly possible to do wellbeing cheap yeah. and poorly, um, and it's it's also possible to do wellbeing well, and uh, and to bring about uh, you know people's improvement in their in their uh, in their wellbeing. And uh, so, um, for me. I was around in the 1990s. That's how old I am. <laughs> and we had this thing called uh, teaching, teaching people to cope uh, yeah. back then. And, uh, you know, and, and actually, look, you know, to me, uh, I think we, I was very excited in 2010 because I thought we were moving towards a more organizational based well-being and, you know, reducing mental health and mental ill health, you know, increasing people's mental health and making them feel good at work to a really um a reactionary basis again hmm. and it's and it's reacting consistently at in the level at the individual um you know I, I i do have to stop myself because you know my position on on this, this <laughs> movement towards mindfulness and resilience of individuals but not of organizations um yeah and it's interesting a lot of well-being apps that we see actually pull it back to the individual again so yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's my starter for 10. Uh, but yes, yeah. you could certainly spend 40 minutes alone talking about the, from the frustrations um, that there we have to do well-being systematically and structurally at organizational levels. Um, and if we don't do that, then we are going to be, um, we're going to find ourselves in trouble, I think would be the best bet. Uh, which would lead me to ask you this, my next question, which what are your predictions, right? We're always in about yeah. always looking to the future here for the future of well-being in the UK. Now, Jamie, give me the ideal picture <laughs> and then give me something else of yeah, where well, you think we're probably going to be. I think I think the something else is probably the the easier one, isn't it? And and I can envisage a, a messy couple of years ahead as we try and navigate through um, a, a really kind of a, a few different challenges coinciding. So uh, to your point around kind of growth spurts, I think that's that's a really helpful way of, of phrasing it. Um, we we need another one of those in, in the wellbeing space, and we need another um, kind of step forward in terms of our maturity. But we're doing that at a time where kind of organisational budgets uh, around this are, are likely going to be cut. The kind of the, the threat of recession, the other cost of living challenges mean that, as we were saying earlier, the opportunity to be strategic and to, to kind of really think ahead perhaps aren't there at the minute. Uh, the resource perhaps isn't there at the minute. So I can see us needing to, to muddle through a little bit. Um, and I think, Hayley, you mentioned about the role of line managers. I think that's absolutely critical for navigating us through a lot of the challenges um, that we're seeing at the minute when i get out and about in the business and, and speak to ours they're seeing stuff come across their desk which they've not seen before both in terms of kind of the the severity and, and the frequency in some cases of, of those challenges outside of work um, and that's something which historically we haven't necessarily given them the the kind of the tools to to support and to, to sign those around so i think there's a there's a real crucial role for, for helping line managers get us through this in terms of some of the, the kind of predictive elements, I think, and we've spoken about this uh, at length before, the kind of increased legislation in this space, I think is something which which we need. Um, some of that will kind of, it's the, oh, what gets measured, what uh, gets managed uh, adage, isn't it? And some of that will probably be a little clunky to start off with, and it, and it might be a little basic, but if it orientates kind of attention and crucially resource to this, like we've seen in kind of, ESG social value spaces over the, the past couple of years, then that can only be a good thing. The more more attention and resource we've got in this space, the more opportunity we've got for, for good people to do good things. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful that that will um, that will uh, lead to development and certainly watching what's happening in Australia with with interest and working with our teams over there on uh, on the the legislation on psychosocial risk that that they're uh, navigating. Um, and I also think there's there's something around kind of the the pendulum swinging back an element too. So when I first started in wellbeing, which was kind of 10 years ago now, um, the the focus is around kind of wellbeing and performance. And that was the thing that really got me excited about uh, this topic because it's how we can kind of get the most out of our lives, how we can 
as I said earlier, kind of make work good for us and, and deliver things for us as individuals and the organizations. And we've swung to the complete opposite um, end of the spectrum, I, I think, and with good reason, given some of the, the things that we've navigated in that time. And I would like to think that that would, would come back a little bit more towards the let's talk about hard things. Let's talk about how we navigate those hard things and how we use those to, to, to benefit us in, in life and, and as an organization. Um, and, uh, and we can yeah, find, find ways of improving all of our performance at, at work and at home and, and making our lives better out of all of this rather than just kind of trying to pull us out of the river and, and mitigate against some of it. I've never heard it said better, even at Hyde Park at the corner, on the speaker's <laughs> corner. <laughs> I'm still um, on the box. Yeah. But no, I mean, it is. You, oh, absolutely. I think I, 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 yeah, you're taller than me. I have to have two boxes just to just be seen. Um, so, but yeah, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm with you on the, you know, the future, like trying to get it into systems and processes and, I mean, it'd be interesting, Hayley, what about yourself? What do you think the predictions for, for the future of well-being? I think I'm going to start with a narrow approach. I think we need to look at current resource. I've picked up on a couple of threads on LinkedIn of people who are in the space who, I mean, lots of them, you know, who are struggling and who are the, the only voice. And I think that really needs to be looked at in terms of, how are we going to have an impact? Jamie touched on it earlier. Whose responsibility is it, et cetera? Um, and then also against the landscape of diversity, against the landscape of different generations coming through the door and their expectation of an employee value proposition, that's going to completely change things. But we are going to come across a really in my view, there's going to be a conflict of priorities because of ways it's always been done and ways it's now expected to be done and how quickly can we transition to that that space, you know? And I think we're already in that space. Uh, and sometimes you're playing catch up, sometimes you're leading on certain things, but I think they're going to be some interesting and challenging conversations. Um, and then I think also coming back to what Jamie said, the link back to performance. So we're speaking a lot about risk and risk mitigation, but also that part of work is such a massive part of our lives. And I, I recall a couple of weeks ago when we were all together, actually, in London in that meeting room is, when do we get to a point where it, it's not a choice? You know, you don't have to give up. It's part of and everything. There just feels like there's an equal balance in terms of, of life and being able to thrive rather than like Jamie says, we're constantly working towards achieving that state. That's what I would like to think we're going to get to, but you know, what does utopia look like? However, I think there are some fundamental challenges um, in, in the next couple of, of years. So, yeah, but I think we're almost coming to a close and I'd just love to hear from you, Jamie, one key takeaway around psychological health and safety and well-being for our listeners. Yeah, so, I, I mean, there's a, a long list, but to, to narrow it down to one, I, I would just encourage people to, to go and make a start on this. So I know that when you sit down in front of the kind of the 45,003 standard and read through it, it can feel a bit daunting at first, certainly when I first uh, landed in Circo and, and started on the, that process, it, it did feel it, but actually it is such a, uh, an empowering process to, to go through. And even if you decide not to go all the way through, kind of going to, to audit stage, you will learn so much and you will improve so much within, within the organization just by making those steps. So yeah, get the, um, uh, get the standards, go through a, a gap analysis, do that little mini pre audit for, Itself and get the various stakeholders around the table and have that conversation. And, and that'll be such a, a powerful starting point um, for, for improving things where you are. Okay. Well, Jamie, we've come nearly to the end. I feel like it's on a, one of those, you know, programs. And finally, <laughs> <laughs> but what we, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. It's so nice to talk to people that are um, doing what we've been advocating for years and, and finding it okay to do in the same process. So for our listeners, um, 
if you've liked what you've heard, like and subscribe to the Psych Health and Safety podcast to hear from future guests. Uh, looking at, we're looking really to move the needle in health, safety, and well-being space, and hopefully that's what we will achieve. Don't forget, you can watch video on YouTube, Flourish DX, LinkedIn pages for short clips, and obviously connect with Haley and I uh, over LinkedIn. I'm, Jamie's very approachable as well so we're all happy to to hear from you and thank you for listening and we look forward to hearing from from you Jamie many many times you've been listening to the psych health and safety podcast to stay up to date with the latest on psychological injury prevention follow flourish dx on linkedin and subscribe to the psych health and safety podcast at www.psychhealthandsafety.com